Okay, good evening, everyone. Very good evening to you all, and a warm welcome uh, to, to King's. Some housekeeping, of course, first. Um, we're not expecting a fire drill. So uh, if you hear an alarm, please leave your belongings uh, and make your way downstairs and through the, through the fire exits uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, secondly, format for this evening. Uh, we're going to have about an hour here um, for the seminar. Um, and that will be followed by refreshments just down the hallway. So we'll usher you uh, towards those. And uh, please do stay and, and talk with each other and, and, and talk with Dan and um, yeah, make, make, make the most of that opportunity. Um, during the seminar, uh, there will be some interactive parts. Um, uh, and so you're very um, much encouraged to participate in, in, in the interactive parts. And we will, of course, take questions and comments, I think, Dan. You're okay of with course, comments, yeah, aren't you? Uh, no mono monologues, please, but uh, comments uh, are um, perfectly welcome. Um, but please wait to be prompted for that. We have a roving mic system um, because this event is being recorded. Um, those of you familiar with the, uh, with the series uh, webpage will see that the recordings are hosted against each event. So the mic picks up your voice for that recording, particularly those at the back. Um, Nathan, I know you have a booming voice, but even you would need the microphone, is my point. <laughs> that wasn't on the recording, you see? There we go. Um, so uh, this is the latest event in the, hi, can I come in? In the Future of Legal Practice series, hosted by the um, Professional Law Institute, um, as depicted on our banners. Uh, the Professional Law Institute is currently running a postgraduate diploma in law and an MSc in law and professional practice, um, which welcomed its second cohort in September. Uh, and we are delighted to see some of our wonderful students here this evening. I'm catching their eye to embarrass them now. Uh, the Future of Legal Practice series was launched in 2019 um, and has featured many valued voices including law firm partners, in-house counsel, a law commissioner, uh, the dean of the Dixon Poon School of Law, um, academics, technologists, um, and many more on subjects, including the impact of technologies on legal services, digital assets, practicing for justice in the future, and future skills. Uh, most recently, last month, uh, we were joined by LexisNexis in a webinar um, where they uh, presented the results of their survey on the sector's attitudes towards new technologies um, and showcased their generative AI tool just prior to its launch in the United States. I say that um, because as part of that webinar, Karen Waldron of Lexis referred to task replacement and Moravec's great flood, depicting rising waters ascending a valley where new technologies outperform humans on various tasks, changing the services, the recruitment and retention landscape. And this depiction included words like leadership, phrases like emotional intelligence, negotiation, social interaction. In now, uh, for now at least, um, the cliffs above that waterline. And that related to the current and future value of inherently human skills. And Karen's reference um, to that depiction links very nicely with our, with our speaker this evening. So we are thrilled to welcome Dan Kane's voice to this series. Dan is the founder of O-Shaped, an initiative he set up in 2019 with the mission of making the legal profession better for those who are in it, for those who use it, and for those who are entering it. I think we have all three of those categories in, in the room this evening. Dan's previously been widely recognized as a forward-thinking, progressive general counsel with a focus on putting people at the heart of the profession. He's been in the Legal 500 GC power list on two occasions, 2020 and 2021, uh, and was shortlisted for GC of the Year at the Lawyer Awards in 2019. Uh, Dan trained at Deckert before moving in-house to Network Rail in 2007. And in 2015, 
He spent a year as senior program manager, leading several strategic corporate projects across the company. Between 2016 and 2022, he was general counsel at Network Rail, leading a team of 20 lawyers. And Dan left in April 2022 to pursue his passion with O-Shaped full time. Dan is passionate about leadership development, people, and leading cultural change throughout the legal profession, particularly through mindset change, as well as human and business skills development. Before I give Dan the floor, it would be great to get a sense of who's in the room. So, can I please ask to you to raise your hand if you are currently working in the legal sector, including legal education? Working in any other sector? And a current student. Okay, that's your room, Dan. Mm. Um, Good. Dan, Hello. the floor is yours. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. I am being mic'd, so hopefully for the record people will hear. But if you do want to comment, I tend to be quite informal in these conversations and pieces. So if you do want to comment, please just raise your hand. We'll make sure you get a mic, or I will feed it back through the mic to make sure everyone is heard and contributes to the conversation. Because that's what really O-Shaped is about. It's about engaging with people. It's about trying to understand different people's perspectives. And so O-Shaped really, I think, is probably the best way to describe it would be to share a bit more about how we'll play it today. I mean, I'm conscious that this will be new to many people. I want to talk about people first, which is at the heart of O-Shape, but in a digital world, uh, I'm not an expert, by the way, in AI, so if you're expecting to hear from an expert in AI, feel free to step out and leave the room right now. I am much more thinking about how do we embrace and enhance the human skills within an increasingly digital world. I want to then look at what value creation means within our sphere, within the legal profession, and I explain particularly for the student community here, what I mean by value creation and why it's so important. And how can we start embedding O-Shaped, whatever our roles, from day one? So let's kick off with the five O of the O-Shaped mindset. When Lloyd introduced me, he kindly described, actually, what feels like a more glittering career, thank you, than I realized I had. So that's great to know. Um, but I'd spent a year before I was a general counsel. Now, for those of you who don't know, general counsel are the most senior lawyers within a corporate. And Network Rail is a big corporate with 40,000 people in the country. Uh, and so I was the lead lawyer for a large part of that. But before I took that role on, I spent time as a commercial program manager. And that means I used the legal team when I was in that organization. What was really interesting, when you are using a legal team, a lawyer for the first time as I was, just the impression that was created from the rest of the organization. They felt the legal team were too risk averse. They felt the legal team slowed things down with all their clever law stuff. They felt that perhaps we weren't engaging with them in a way that they understood. And so what I saw was a real split between business and ultimately why people become lawyers is to enable us to do, deliver better outcomes for clients. And businesses are often the clients. We're not really clear on what the purpose of the legal team was. And even more so then, the purpose of why we ever need to use lawyers at all, because frankly, can't we just get on with what we want to do, and that's make business happen. So legal were perceived quite awfully, frankly, at times, even described as a value hoover by one of the colleagues, <laughs> sucking all the value out of what they were doing every day. So when I led the team, I did so on the basis of let's put people first and then lawyers. That's not to detract from the importance of being a lawyer. It was more about saying, if we interact on a human level with our colleagues, we're going to understand them much better. That means we can understand what they're worried about, what concerns them. That means we'll understand what keeps them awake at night. And we can then advise them in a much more sensible, in-context, relevant way. Sounds simple. But unfortunately, the kind of skills that are required to do that are not the kind of skills that are traditionally taught through the legal system. So when I brought people into the team, I wanted this well-rounded, hence O-shaped, in case you were wondering about the O, mindset, so well-rounded. And these were the five O's that I brought together. Really, they look like just five words beginning with O. And to the uh, perhaps more assuming of you, you'll be spot on right. They are just five words beginning with O that came to mind. But actually, when I started to think about why they mattered, I hope you'll share with me the importance of them. 
the idea of being open. I wanted people with an open mindset, open to new ideas, open to new ways of working, open with their emotions. The idea in our profession that you can be good at what you do and demonstrate emotions is very rare. Vulnerability is not something that's ever been considered relevant to the legal industry. I wanted people who would be much more original in their thinking, who would be more innovative and creative. Again, whether you're in the profession or coming into the profession, innovation is seen as an add-on, not part of the day job. I wanted people who came in and would be much more creative in their thinking. I wanted people who would be much more proactive in how they worked. They wouldn't sit and wait for work to come to them. They would be going out there and look for and be proactive with networks and take opportunities. We all will get opportunities that will come and go. What I wanted were people who would find them and then make the most of them. I wanted people who would take responsibility, this O for ownership. Not just of their own careers, which is clearly important, but also of the advice we're giving. I saw it too often where lawyers would give advice and then step back and say, that's a commercial problem that you now need to deal with. Over to the business. Actually, if we're going to truly deliver a great service to our colleagues within our businesses or our clients, we need to start owning the outcome as well as just feeding in and dispensing knowledge. And finally, optimism. It is allowed, by the way, to enjoy your job. You can come in and have a very positive mindset, which means that we can come in and make sure that we're looking at how we can make things happen as opposed to finding all the reasons why you can't. My schooling in law was look for all the things that could go wrong. What I think the narrative is shifting is how do we help identify how things can happen and make them work. And so that was the O-shaped mindset. And I started sharing this thinking around the legal industry at conferences, and it got lots of interest and attention. And so we decided as a small working group that got together, cross industry, that was private practice, so people in law firms, in-house, so people who were in corporates within the legal teams, and other consultants in the industry came together and said, we need to understand a bit more about what the client, the end user, thinks what makes a great lawyer, a really effective lawyer in the modern day. And so we interviewed and they said three things broadly. They said, firstly, we expect the lawyers to know the law. Sounds obvious, but that's a given, right, that you'll know the law. I'm not saying it's easy, and many of you are going through this exercise now of learning it. It's hard, but it's considered by people who use legal services that you'll get it right. Secondly, knowledge of your client, knowledge of your business is essential. So making sure if you're going to be advising people, you understand their business and what drives them, what motivates them, and then you can advise, as I say, much more in context. And finally, this idea of create value. Lawyers cannot simply be there to dispense knowledge. They must surely generate value for the clients and organizations that they work with. So what does it mean to be a value-creating lawyer? And we'll look at some of that now. But what they highlighted were 12 attributes that have become known as the O-shaped attributes. Please go on in. Sorry. Um, and they split into these buckets. And these are the buckets that we'll focus on. The importance of building relationships and this idea of emotional intelligence that's often overlooked. EQ, most people I hope are familiar with the idea of emotional intelligence. EQ as opposed to IQ. IQ has for many, many years been the, uh, the leading indicator of what makes a great lawyer, whereas actually what we're seeing now is much more of the emotional intelligence playing a part. EQ very much is being part of how does it mean to deliver a service. There is always a person at the end of that service, therefore understanding and what, what, they, are, what they are thinking, how they are feeling matters. And then we go through this whole idea. There are 12 attributes. You'll make sure if you want these slides, you can have them with pleasure. Um, but the key here is to show how they go through this range of once you've established a relationship, you can create value. Once you've created value, you then need to make sure you, you adapt to sustain that value. And no better place is there to show how lawyers and our profession needs to adapt than what's happening with AI, generative AI in particular, that's starting to disrupt the profession. Certainly people are talking about it disrupting the profession, but we'll think a little bit about whether that and how much of that is reality as against hype. So what I'm kind of keen to do is to share a bit more about what people first means, and then I want to get your take a little bit through polls as to what your thinking is around AI. Because my thinking on people first and our vision about people first really mattering breaks down really into these areas. And this is a quote that I will often use, and I think there's been no presentation over the last year given where I haven't mentioned this quote, so I'm going to just keep consistent and share it with you. This was from Marriott, if anyone is familiar of Marriott Hotels, the person that founded them, said, take good care of your employees and they'll take good care of your customers and your customers will come back. This idea that people very much are the heart of your offering, and if they are well invested in, whether trained, developed, looked after, encouraged, recognized, valued, 
they will deliver a better outcome for your customers or your clients. Your customers or your clients will then come back. Think about any product you use, any brand you're interested in. They get that having a motivated, loyal team helps their people deliver better outcomes for their customers, and you will be loyal to that brand. It shouldn't be different within the legal profession, but traditionally it has been. So I think well-being, making sure we have a fit and healthy workforce is key. It's not only the right thing to do, but actually, frankly, absence costs lots of money. That people come into work and have a real sense of what they're doing, that you can see that line between what you're doing every day and what the outcome of that work is. You're connected with a purpose, an organizational purpose, and your values are connected. That creates much more of a sense of meaning and why you're doing things. That you'll be much more engaged. There are regularly now within big corporates, they have these engagement surveys, see how engaged their employees are. And frankly, they produce a number. The reality is that number is just that, a number. What does it feel like to be part of a team there? What does it feel like to work in that organization? That's what we're talking about engagement because that breeds loyalty and that breeds better performance. And finally, within the world we now live, post-COVID in particular, the legal profession is finally, to an extent, embracing flexibility hoping to try and open up the profession to a broader and more diverse community, we are now recognizing that people can work at home and do it well. We're recognizing that people can work part-time and do it well. If we want to get the best out of people, we need to make sure that we're working, not dancing to their tune, but working with people and our employees. That creates the loyalty. That creates a better outcome for customers. That's what people first means to O'Shea. But of course, it's being really challenged in the AI world. So what I want you to do is to get your phones out for now, or your laptops if you're logged on, and I'd like you to answer this question at menti.com. I'm going to just hopefully be able to share it with you on here. So if you see at the top, it's got menti.com, and the code is there, 59472785. Menti.com. I'm really keen to know what you feel about the potential impact of generative AI on the profession, because that's where I think the impact and the crossover with people really matters. So before I go to the next bit, I'm really keen to see what you think about this bit. How do you feel about it? Really excited. We've got one. Very interested, skeptical, or threatened. Uh, so you found it. Anyway, I'm going to leave you just for 30 seconds uh, as you're doing that. Okay, thank you. So actually, we've got heavily weighted towards the left-hand side to show that we're excited or interested to see the potential of it, which is quite ironic for many of you that shows that there's not that many lawyers existing in the room, frankly, as opposed to lawyers who are, or aspiring lawyers, because lawyers who are qualified, according to Larry Richard uh, uh, um, in the US, who talks about the lawyer brain, and who has studied the lawyer brain for many years, says that lawyers are in the 91st percentile for skepticism. Uh, and there you go, that's when you say, no, we're not, whatever it is. So that's, can't believe it, can't believe it, exactly. So uh, I think we're in a good place there. So there's quite a positive vibe, I would like to think, in this room about the potential of AI, which brings me on then to, um, so thank you for that, which brings me on now then to this question of what does it mean to be people first in a digital world? And many of you may be familiar with this quote that was, came from an IBM report relatively recently. AI will not replace people, but people who use AI will replace people who do not. But this is a really hot debate within the profession at the moment. Goldman Sachs produced a report that said 66% of legal tasks would be replaceable by AI. Uh, further reports that have been produced suggest that within a year, the AI will be able to do the job of a paralegal. And within five years, it will be able to replace an average lawyer. I have no idea what an average lawyer looks like or feels like, but it will be replaced in five years. The reality is that the hype sometimes doesn't necessarily belie what's underneath it. And I'm hearing all areas of spectrum from law firms to in-house corporate teams saying that it's something that will be quite useful in a few years to, gosh, this is going to massively transform what we're doing day to day. A couple of things that I think from a human perspective. What we're talking about with emotional intelligence, what we're describing when we talk about the attributes I shared within the mindset, they are currently, currently 
not obviously replaceable by AI. The use case for AI we're talking about in our industry is not what, quite what Elon Musk is talking about when he was interviewed by the Prime Minister the day to say that all of our jobs will effectively be irrelevant and you can choose to work if you want. We are much more at the end of the scale that it can start to do the lower level work much faster and help us then build, be more efficient, we do more quicker, better, faster, smarter. And I think in truth, that's not a massive leap from where we could be in our profession through the existing AI. What's, what's gonna be the real challenge with our profession is not what the technology can do, but whether we as legal professionals will sufficiently embrace it. Because lawyers' skepticism, lawyers' mindset is very fixed generally on this is an expert field and only we can deliver this knowledge. The danger with doing that, of course, is the more you talk about knowledge, the easier ChatGPT will be in the future to replace people. What's going to happen is we're going to have people doing different tasks, not doing completely eradicating the whole of the legal profession. What I think I'm seeing now is this spectrum from no impact to full impact. When I work a lot with corporate in-house lawyers, and for them, this idea where they're all under this loads of pressure from their finance directors to reduce their cost, this is a massive opportunity because they are all doing work that they are being asked to do that, frankly, isn't necessary for them to do and could be done in a holistically different way. Anyone who's familiar, though, with the other part of the profession, in particular the law firms, who base their current model on Anyone familiar with the billable hour, even if your students, hopefully you've come across that concept where time is money, then this idea of doing things super fast really challenges the very fabric of what they're doing day in, day out. And for the more progressive-minded lawyers and law firms and in-house team, I think this presents an incredible opportunity. But it can only have the impact we feel it should have if we get the mindset bit right. I just don't simply believe that the current mindset of lawyers, which is keep working away, doing what we're doing, it will go away soon, is yet ready for the potential that the generative AI has. And that presents a brilliant opportunity for someone or some people who can see the idea of doing things very differently. So that, for me, is why I think we're in this unknown. We don't have a crystal ball, but I don't believe that the skills that we're talking about here, the human and business skills that we're focused on, are replaceable anytime soon. Lawyers are paid for their judgment. They're paid for their ability to interact with other people. It's a people business. You'll hear that a lot. It's a relationship business. And that's why I say to a lot of people, if it is a relationship people business, why are we not investing more time in developing those skills? When I O-Shape started, I started talking to law schools. And I engaged with lots of law schools in the UK. And I was saying to them, the modules that you're currently doing are exactly the same in the LPC that I was doing 20-something years ago. And it was kind of, don't worry, the SQE is coming in and that will address it. Well, I don't think the SQE necessarily has moved on from being a very uh, uh, academic type approach to, uh, to, to people who are aspiring to be lawyers and going through that system. And the conversations I've been having and some of the success we've been having with the law schools is to broaden that curricula to recognize as much as anything that all your learning has a client at the end of it. And so as being a general counsel, I was a client of law firms and I had a voice because we spent money with law firms. And ultimately, money counts within the professions. It does everywhere, but it ticks a lot of boxes for law firms, who ultimately then have a real influence on law school. So the community of O-Shape has become very much led by the client, the in-house general counsel and corporate teams. And they're the ones driving change to law firms that is impacting the curricula at law schools. And so if law schools are now going to really help broad and curricular, so there were learning things that are really valuable, these human and business skills that are incredibly valuable to thrive today, then we need to start thinking about how do we bring that across the whole system and not just the legal education system, because we'll throw people into law firms who really are focused at the moment on the technical learning and the billable hour. So I want to move on because I want to just share with you um, the, some more of the output from those interviews. And those interviews I said to you talked about legal knowledge being a given. And it talked about knowing the business and creating value. And here's my kind of take on those three things briefly. I'm going to leave, by the way, sorry, there's two, two things. I'm going to leave the legal knowledge as a given because it's a given. So I don't need to talk more about it. You will all be brilliantly smart at that stuff. <clears throat> what I want to talk a little bit is about how we're seeing the clients use this. So this is about an in-house function. I want to talk about them for a minute. And how they're showing they're adding value, but the principles apply to anyone who is entering a law firm too 
or of running a law firm. Walking a mile in their shoes is about empathy. Empathising with people is, again, a word that's not been used very much in our industry. Leading with empathy is becoming much more of a common thing out in other industries. Why are we not using it more in our industry? And that means understanding what it's like to be in the other person's shoes, what it feels like to be them. I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase. It's a wonderful uh, quote from Mary Angelou. who says, people will forget what you did, they'll forget what you said, but you'll, they'll never forget how you made them feel. So understanding how people feel and what we're doing is really important, and that means we need to understand their world much better. I've mentioned already the importance of relationships. It's kind of the foundation for everything. That's why networks are critical. And to me, that spending time building relationships must be a priority. But again, as an industry, we've never taught people how to do that. We've never valued that. You've never got to the top of the tree within the legal profession by just going out building relationships, because that takes time when you could be doing much more billable work. And at the moment, the, the, and still, until we can get over this hurdle of it's really valuable to spend time building relationships, and in fact, the EQ is as important as the IQ, we're still going to have these challenges. Being curious is essential, whether you are a student, whether you are a user of legal services, whether you are in legal services, trying to understand where people are coming from, asking those questions, as opposed to just delivering advice, is essential. And finally, this perception point. And I want to just touch on this perception point because this is something that might come as a bit of a shock. And when I talk to people about the perception of lawyers, and I feel for people going into the profession, don't worry, we're changing this, mm -hmm. that there is a kind of negative perception of lawyers out there. Now, there was a survey done, and I appreciate this is going back to 2016, and there isn't anything much more recently. I'm going to share a few bits of um, research with you. But this was done by the legal services consumer tracker. So they looked at the medical profession where they said 80% of people trust what doctors say. Does anyone want to hazard a guess at the number of people that said how much they trust what lawyers say? Just anyone had to again? 30%. 30%. percent Anyone have any better than 30%? Higher, lower, higher. It feels like I'm in a, in a game show. Nine. 9%. <laughs> Gosh, wow. Uh, yeah, okay. So you've obviously worked with a lot of lawyers as well. <laughs> um, anyone else? Last guess? 25. Okay, so we're getting closer. Or we're, getting, we're not getting closer. Anyway, it's 42, right? So 42%, that's less than one in two people who speak to lawyers. Oh, and based there, look, it's not covered everyone, but it's a consumer user of legal services that they didn't trust what the lawyer was telling them. Now, it doesn't get any better. The, the slide I'm about to show you was a study done at Princeton University in the States, and that was two professors there, and they looked at a load of different professions back in 2014, and they mapped them on two axes. That one axis, the horizontal one you'll see there, is all about, is all about their uh, ability to be technically correct. And then on the uh, vertical axis, you'll see uh, warmth or trust or compassion. Back to the things we were talking about, right? So let me show you this one. Lawyer is in the bottom right. So very highly competent technically. Uh, you can see the top right. That's where we want to be, nurse or doctor. They're both competent and professor. Uh, competent, but also they have this demonstrate this warmth. And this warmth is the ability to be able to build connections. Now, some of you have turned your attention already to the bottom left, which has got prostitutes. Um, and, but it is a joy to know that lawyers do have slightly more compassion than prostitutes. Uh, having said that, it's 10 years ago, so that might have changed either way. I don't know. I'm not familiar with uh, one of those two professions. So what we're seeing is a very highly competent group of people that lack lots of the capabilities and the skills that come with warmth or trust or compassion. Now, again, it's not just this one. If the two pieces weren't enough, I'll give you a third piece of information. And again, I accept, as some people say, these are out of date. In some respects, they're not, because frankly, there isn't anything that tells any different now. This one is from uh, 2016, a Gallup survey, actually. And it was looking at trust. Nurses, again, hit the top. Again, from the States, lawyers, 18%. percent so are not bad compared to them. Um, forget the politicians at the bottom there. The one I want to ask you about is car salespeople. I'm always interested in car salespeople. Uh, does anyone, has anyone got a family member before I go on car salespeople? Okay, so I'm going to be really, really careful with what I say now. Um, I'm talking at the moment about perception, right? So one person in the room has a family member uh, in car sales, okay? I want you to go back on your phones where I'm going to ask you a question. And so, knowing that one person in the room, by the way, don't let that influence what you're going to say. I'm really interested to know whether or not, back on your, uh, hopefully there should be the next question that will come up, um, will be three words. I want you to tell me the three words that come to mind when you think about car salespeople. The three words that come to mind when you think about car salespeople. And we'll know uh, if, I bet we can spot the person that knows. We'll see. 
So hopefully you can do that. You've got up to three words that you can spot, and then we will move on. Um, this is all about trust. So the bigger the word, for those of you who aren't familiar with word clouds, the bigger the word, the more it is typed in. Um, so, they're just coming up now. You are the most positive I've seen, which is great. Although liar is the top one at the moment. So, uh, okay, so, that's not an unusual spread. Um, of words that are coming in. Uh, pushy, liar, cunning. Okay, that's not too bad. Persuasive is not too bad. But pushy is usually the one that comes out number one when we do this, right? Pushy. Now, the reason I ask this question to people is not because it's quite funny to me, but, but the point is that we're basing this on perception of what we've seen or heard as opposed to what's real. And so there will be lots of great car salespeople out there that are really honest, that are not liars, that they aren't pushy, they genuinely want to sell you a product that will be brilliant for you and maybe your young child that is very safe when you're driving around on the school run. They won't play with the speedometer if that's still a thing that people do. People are still going for it. People are still going for it. The point is that we make judgments now based on what we hear and see around us as opposed to what really is truth. And so what we're seeing is now people who are great car salespeople will be tarnished with the brush of what 99% of people think which is that they are liars, they're pushy, they're untrustworthy, they are persuasive, which is not too bad. And I think the point about this is that many people experience that with lawyers too. People have a perception of lawyers that's quite negative. I said earlier on when I was in the business as a commercial program lead that they wanted me to help them get around having to use lawyers. That's how they saw me as being useful to them. The reality was they saw them as being slow, as being a bit arrogant, being a bit aloof, being a bit further away from them that really they wanted. They wanted people on their side who would help them deliver better outcomes. I'd love us to do this with people who weren't in the legal profession. I haven't yet done it. Maybe we can go down to the next corridor and ask the lecture room there <coughs> this question about lawyers. I'm not saying it would be quite as negative as that, but I promise you it wouldn't be particularly positive. So it's really important that we think about perception when we're talking about relationships and when we're talking about value. And I want to come on to value. Um, the point about value, I think, is, hopefully it will come up now, is that we can't just simply be doing our jobs, delivering legal advice and hoping that it lands and does a great job and everyone's happy and walks away. And we go home thinking, we've been brilliant again today. Pat ourselves on the back. Really, value for me has got to be about, and this is in-house teams that I'm speaking from this perspective, but it applies to law firms. The difference with law firms is that they see value as the amount of hours they've done. You can't confuse activity with productivity was a phrase I once heard and I quite like. People are very busy in our profession. The number one question, ask a lawyer what their response will be, and you say, how are you? The number one response is busy. Isn't that amazing? Not on fine, thanks, how are you? It's how are you? I'm oh, really busy. Yeah, really busy. Are they busy doing the right stuff? Are they busy doing stuff that really creates value for their organization or their client? Yes, obviously, because we're brilliant lawyers. But the reality is often very different. So we want to get under the skin of what they mean by value. And I talk to lots of teams in-house and private practice when they talk about their fabulous outcomes they're having. What's the value you're contributing? We need to understand what that means for their client or customer. I use customer a lot. We still use client a lot in the profession. I like customer. It makes me feel a little bit more wanted as a user. Um, Judgment and risk management, you know, lawyers are risk managers in so many ways. We see risks and the great lawyers are those who are able to assess those risks and give really forward thinking advice based on the risks that exist. The other lawyers that I struggle with are those that hide behind the risks. Because I promise you it's dead easy to point out loads of things that can go wrong, right? It's dead easy to go, oh, that's a bit risky. For instance, I remember saying to a CFO, one of our chief financial officers, going back, and this was when I was a little bit more of a junior lawyer in-house, and I presented this beautifully crafted contract that I'd spent lots of time with our external lawyers on, and mine. I'd been, honestly, I, I loved it. It was a brilliant piece of work. I thought it was fabulous. Uh, and he looked through it, and he said to me, Dan, you've not provided for any spiders landing from Mars. <laughs> and I thought, what the hell does he mean by that? Let me think about this. 
i.e. you've basically got the kitchen sink in there. And I obviously went away and then drafted a clause just in case spiders <laughs> landed from Mars. I did not want to miss that point. But he was trying to show me that what really mattered to him was the commercial reality, not how many brilliant words I could use and how much Latin I was able to put into the contract. And that was a real lesson for me. And since then, I hope I've brought to life for people this need to be able to talk the language of business, the language of the client, and the people we are working with. Whether you choose to go into the commercial side of the profession or you're in it, whether you are much more in the family side of the profession, it doesn't really matter. We all have clients, we all have people that we're engaging with. And being able to deliver advice in a way that helps them achieve their goals is really what we're there for. But you'd be amazed by how few lawyers are capable of doing that effectively all the time. Why? Because largely we are, with obviously present company accepted, schooled to believe that writing as many things down as possible shows we're cleverer. Trust me, I was a first year at Leeds, first year student, I remember it well. I did law, I passed contract, and, and I passed taught in the first year, and I used nutshell, right? Okay, sorry, hold my hands up. And what I did was, I wrote as many cases down as I could in my assignment. And the person in the dorm next to me said, I'm gonna try and beat you by writing more cases down, and he did. Um, the, but the point was that became a game, right? And what we're talking about now is how do we get to the stage where we're delivering great outcomes for our customers or clients? And that, for me, is value. And also, this back to this word innovate and create. There is no need, no need for us to think about innovation as being this eureka moment. You're in the bath and you go, wow, I'm going to change the world. It's what can we do every day that's a bit better? Better every day used to be a phrase I heard a lot. How can we get these marginal gains that each day we're improving, we're getting better, and we can look at ourselves and think, do you know what, that is a good day because I've learned something, I've practiced something, I've improved something. That's about making things better. And I want to share this picture with you and this story with you to just tell you what I think is about lawyering uh, and um, what it means, I think, to be uh, a really good lawyer now. That is not a good place to be, by the way. Um, those of you who are struggling to see the sign, it's pretty bright warning that you do not want to be crashing into that bridge if you are an articulated lorry. Now, believe it or not, that bridge was, this is back to my train railway days in network rail, that was the 120th time that that had been hit, right? Crazy, right? 120 times. Uh, and it had just been reopened and it got hit again. Now, you might think careless, but there were 2,000 of those every year on the rail network. There still are not quite that many, but there's still quite a lot. I'm not as close to it now. Uh, and it's huge amount of delay, huge amount of cost, huge amount of people time trying to address the, the horrendous kind of aftermath of dealing with this. There's the bridge damage. We need to close the bridge. The trains can no longer go across the bridge. How are we going to move the lorry? And so you get then poor passengers sitting on the train get an average of two hours delay. Not great, reputationally horrible for our business. And I care about the reputation of our business because I'm a lawyer who's commercially minded and I'm in the business. And I could say, well, do you know what? We could take the classic lawyer approach because the lawyers could go, 2,000 claims, that's awesome. We've got so much work to do. You know, isn't it great, right? And you could go, we've got negligence, we've got breach of contract. I could say, I did nutshells on all of this. I've got this covered. Don't worry. I don't know, 14 cases to do with the negligence. And, and I could call my friend who's now a partner at a law firm. Incidentally, he knows 16 cases. So we've got that covered, right? The reality is your colleagues want to know why is it this keeps happening and what can we do to stop it? And I think great lawyers are in that place looking at solving the problem. What is the cause, not what is the symptom? Because if we keep trying to look at symptoms, we're going to forever be repeating the same stuff time and time again. And I promise you, the 2,000 bridge strikes and all the stuff that comes from that, you want to know where AI will play a part? It's on those 2,000 claims. So the lawyer that's sitting there with contract after contract and claim after claim and loving every minute of it will be the lawyer that gets consumed by and spat out by the artificial intelligence. The lawyers who will remain, I think, exceeding in what they do will be the lawyers here helping their clients solve problems in a sustainable, long-term way. That, for me, depicts where the O-shaped lawyer that I always talked about should be. So how do we then create this? Because it sounds dead easy, and people will have their own examples of this. But how do we create this, this our third bucket of skills, this adaptable learning? If anyone's heard the phrase VUCA, a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world 
that we live in. And I think, frankly, we're in a great place to understand what that means now in terms of complex, volatile, and ambiguous. Um, then adapting to the environment around us and thriving is critical for lawyers as it is with anyone else. And so how do we go about adopting a mindset that means that we will try new things and accept that getting things wrong is OK? Because we've been a profession that has been absolutely obsessed with perfectionism, that we've lost our eye off the ball, that sometimes being good enough is good enough. Now, if anyone's ever heard of the firm Linklater, I can tell you this is a long time, this story, so it's not now, by the way. Fact for the record, this is not now. This is perhaps time gone by. They used to give out pencils. Lots of law firms give out pencils, loads of stuff. They give out pens and mugs. And the pencils would have things on them, and some of them would be really clever, like it'd say really sharp lawyers or something like that for the pencil that would always blunt at the time, which is a bit annoying. But they would then have another one that said, good enough is not good enough. Right? Now, what does that tell you when you're in this environment as a junior lawyer coming through the system that you have to be perfect all the time? It's not real. That just doesn't happen anywhere. Back to this thing about humanity. You cannot be perfect. In fact, if we tried to create a world that was perfect, we'd all be very deeply unhappy if we felt we'd failed. What we've got to get to is a place where lawyers will try new things. We will try and do things a little bit differently, and we'll recognize that we will get things wrong. But we'll learn from that. Because if we don't try new things, you never learn. And there are a million and one fantastic inspirational quotes we could bring up that I only just thought now I could have brought them up, which would show you that, that unless you're pushing the boundaries, unless you're trying new things, you will always just get what you've always done. And our industry has been obsessed with just keeping the status quo as opposed to, because frankly, for the small minority, it's phenomenally successful if money is your measure of success. But the vast majority are not perfectionists. The vast majority don't want to be in that place. They want to be in a place where they can give the flexibility, the freedom, and the empowerment to do the very best they can. And that means making mistakes. If anyone's ever heard of WD-40, has anyone heard of WD-40? Right? Everyone, yeah, people like WD-40. So, uh, it's called WD-40 because the first 39 attempts to get it right failed, right? But now it's the most, one of the most popular um, uh, adhesive types. Well, it's not an adhesive. It's a, it's a uh, what's it, how would you describe it? Is it? Yeah, okay. So, it, so, so that's 39 failures. Dyson, uh, of famous Dyson brands that you'll all be familiar with, had thousands of patents that didn't work out until they landed on uh, the Dyson Hoover, as we now call it now. Um, that shows you that the best inventors, innovators get things wrong. And the legal profession has got to learn from that. And just the final bit on this bit is really about, so Satya Nadella, still the CEO of Microsoft, been there since about 2014. Um, and recognized when he came into Microsoft that Microsoft was losing market share. And although still obviously a massive organization, it was losing that market share and felt that the organization had become complacent, and a bit arrogant, and had become know-it-alls. So he set about creating this growth mindset, this continuous learning mindset, which was all about learn it all, not know it all. And as a result of creating that environment, I want to bring this to life for you, because this isn't just something about classrooms. This isn't just something about law firm. This is how the very best, most sophisticated companies are thinking at the very top. But if we can create this continuous learning mindset, then we're always going to keep improving. We're going to keep growing, and people will be developing. And as a result of what he's been doing, their market share has obviously then zoomed up miles past any of those competitors. Now, we can't say it's all because he created this mindset, but he will say when he sits in, if you ever watch any of his videos and he sits in a room and if he sat like this, he would say it's a core part of how he shifted culture within that organization. Why can't lawyers do the same has been my kind of question. Keep asking that question that we see brilliant practices elsewhere. Why can't lawyers do the same? So how do we get this? Uh, how do we bring it to life? every day and people often say how do we become more oh shit how can we do this now this might not be as relevant for students but i want you to think about how you can make this work particularly as you're going through interview processes yourselves i think from the idea of recruiting people all the way to exit interviews we can start to think in a much broader well-rounded way we can start to apply the mindset about being open about being original about taking opportunities ownership and being optimistic we can adopt that mindset in what we do, and we can start to do a phrase I love, leaders shape and victims grumble. I would love the idea that people leave the room thinking I can make a difference and I can shape something rather than I can just grumble about how crap everything is, because we can all do that. In the same way as we can all grumble about making sure that, you know, anyone that comes up with a great idea, we just go, it'll never work. You ever heard that phrase? I used to hate that. I'll never work. 
Um, but that's a really great loyally type mindset. You know, stick to what we know, very fixed mindset. Um, we can, I think, all take the opportunity to upskill on mindset and behaviors. There is such a poor, uh, 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 I think, narrative out there that says you're either really extrovert and great at doing all of these brilliant skills that we describe, or you just can't do them. So just stick to what you know. The reality is that all of the skills that we've been talking about, all of the attributes of OSHEP, they're all learnable and practicable. But in the same way as you need to practice learning your subject matter to excel in your uh, career, or whether or not you are studying, you also need to practice these skills. They don't just happen. This idea of nature and nurture, I'm sorry, you have to practice feedback. You have to practice being more courageous. Put yourselves in situations where you can demonstrate emotional intelligence. Be prepared to get it wrong, learn from it, and improve. And finally, whatever your values are, whether or not they're organizational, whether or not they're personal, live and breathe them and stick by them. Because frankly, you want now to be part of, and we're seeing much more of these purpose-led organizations, you want to be part of something that you can contribute to and make a difference to. And that means you need to, it sounds a bit trite, but be true to what you believe. And if you're true to what you believe, you're much more likely to do all those things I talked about, about people first being engaged, being motivated, having a sense of purpose. So they, for me, are a really good way that you can live and breathe your values every day and how you can create value. And so my closing piece then, before we open it up for any questions the last couple of minutes that we've got, is to think about those two things. I've talked about the relationships being critical. Go out and find someone that you really want to build a relationship with. Identify someone that you think would be good for your career, would be good to help them in their career, who you feel would be a great mentor or a great advocate for you. And just go and do it. Identify someone. What's the worst they can say is, no thanks, I don't have time. We'll find someone else. But we're too reticent to go out and find someone and ask the question, how can that person help me? And what goes around comes around with that. And, and, and to be honest with you, unless we're starting to create the time for people to help them out, build relationships, build connections, these people will be the people you are going to work with in the future. It might be five years, ten years down the line, but they are going to be people you will come across again and again. So build them now. And finally, if you are working in the environment now and you're not sure about, and I've asked you to think and reflect on value, ask your colleagues, ask your customers, ask your clients, what's the value I am bringing to this relationship? And hopefully, hopefully, you'll get a positive response. But even if you don't, the beauty of feedback is that you can learn from it and improve from it. So that's all I wanted to say for now. There's time for questions, isn't there? There is. I think I'm going to come back up. Uh, oh, brilliant. OK. Um, so I, I won't I'm going to come to the mic so I can be heard by the, the, by the tape. Um, Shall I sit with you? Yeah, please do, Dan. Um, and thank you, Dan. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. I'm very glad we asked you to, to come and deliver that. That was great. Thank you. Um, I've got some questions, but I don't really want to ask them at the expense of you asking them. Um, so we have a roving mic here. Um, so thanks very much for that. Do we have any questions for Dan from the floor? Thanks. So particularly in regards to uh, in-house counsel teams, do you think that the use of AI in the legal profession will contribute to kind of the occasionally false impression of them being locked away in an ivory tower? Or do you think it'll help sort of break down those barriers, free up some time to allow more relationships? That's a great question. Thank you. I'm going to stand up if I may take that. <laughs> um, so in-house teams, I think, have got the greatest opportunity from this. As I said earlier on, law firms might be a bit skeptical because we're skeptics. Um, because of the time-based model. For in-house, there's this real thing at the moment about more for less, right? Do more for less. You've got more work to do, less resource, make it happen. And the reality is that's not possible when people are already at capacity. And everyone you ask is busy, right? I said they're always busy, so how are you going to do more? I think what you'll find is we're going to do different for less. Uh, and that means there's such a great opportunity for in-house to look at what is it we're doing every day of the week, and can we categorically say that's contributing value? Would we be better spending an hour with our stakeholders in our organization rather than spend an hour on that non-disclosure agreement, they always come back to non-disclosure agreements, that frankly nobody cares about, nobody really wants to actually see, and is never going to be litigated on? So am I better spending the hour there, or am I better spending the hour building a relationship? 
And once you've built that relationship, you've got a much better chance of being able to sell your function and demonstrate how credible it is as a function. What I knew when I saw it was there was a really, really good set of people in the legal function. These aren't bad people. These are hardworking people. They were just so disconnected from what the objectives of the organization were that, frankly, the two just never met. And so once we got this idea of trying to understand their world better, dedicate more time that I hope sensible use of AI, generative AI, will bring, will help people get rid of the dross work that they often talk about, and focus more on that relationship building. And you've got the relationship building, you have got so much more credibility with the organization. And so I think the answer is yes, um, but it comes back to do people have the mindset of stepping off what they do every day and spending time on other things. It's, well, we're all busy. There's a brilliant picture. I wish I had it up there now. But um, you, may have, you may have seen it if I describe it um, well enough. There's of a, of a someone riding a chariot with square wheels, right? And so clearly, with square wheels, it is going very slowly. And behind them, there is some poor chap running along with this beautifully crafted round wheel saying, stop, stop, stop. But the people in the chariot are saying, leave us alone, we're far too busy, <laughs> right? And that, for me, depicts a pretty good example of what the legal industry is like. We're so busy doing what we're doing that we're not looking up and out as to what we could do differently to make our jobs easier. And when we do, and we take that round wheel, we can start to focus on the kind of relationships that you described and build the credibility of the in-house function. Great question. Thank you. Um, shall we? What, we'll take uh, that question there, and then we'll come down to the, to the gentleman at the front there. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, up until now, there was a quantifiable measure of value added, so quantifiable in terms of time and hours. If the value moves to relationships, well, how do you think that will impact competitiveness in the legal sphere and between lawyers and law firms? Do you mean internally at law firms, or do you mean, uh, sorry, with, with in-house counsel? Are you looking at law firms where time is, is measured? Because, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's so, so those who, I mean, most of you will be familiar with this whole billable hour where every hour you work, you charge at an hourly rate, and therefore you're encouraged to do as many hours as possible because you can bill as much, and that leads to increased profitability for the organization. Um, there is a huge debate going on at the moment as to whether or not we can try and change this idea of billable hour and have a proxy that's much more about what's actually value to the organization, and can you price things in a way that show that you're genuinely creating value for my organization. Now, it's been around for years, and no one has ever solved it yet. And I think that the right answer must be that with generative AI coming in, that this idea of churning through work and doing it inefficiently, because actually you're rewarded, bizarrely, you're rewarded for doing things inefficiently at the moment, which is crazy system. How is this allowed to continue? But it has for several decades. Before that, by the way, I'm now, only because someone's told me this, before you used to do the billable hour, they used to have the partner at the end of a matter phone the client and say, the file's a bit like this. We think it's worth £10,000. What do you think? We think it's five. I tell you what, let's just bill you £8,000 and everyone goes away happy. Now, we've got this whole idea that we have to measure every single minute of what we're doing. And it leads to huge tension in the industry. Clients get so frustrated with getting a bill that's got six minutes sending an email. And, and, and you know what that means? We're just generating this cottage industry where people are then doing that and watching it. We're wasting so much time. That's where, for me, generative AI will massively make a difference. We should just hopefully do away with the idea of a billable hour when something can be done like that. And that, I think, will start something we can look at what true value means to the client as opposed to just this clock running, I think. I hope that answers your question. You've opened up a massive can of worms with the billable hour question early on, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we had... Two questions um, in the first row and the second row. So we could pass down to, um, there we go, it's landed in the right place there. Thanks. I'll, I'll <clears throat> try and avoid getting it, uh, going off onto the bit of the lower thing because there's, there's lots of very interesting stuff to talk about that, I think. Um, I'm, I'm Jonathan Mansfield. I, I, my background is in private practice for many years. I was a leader in a law firm and now I, I coach uh, and support lawyers. But and, and I think um, the, the, the fact that you come from uh, in ha the in-house uh, environment is, of course, very telling. You know, that's, that's, that's how you tell the story as well. So there's nothing original in that. Um, and it's because you're closer to the commercial reality of, of what the, the client wants. And that's a, that's a real problem for 
uh, private practice is, is, uh, is bridging that gap. But I'm wondering how it hit, and, and that's why your message is, 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 is slower. Yeah. It's a message which has to be got through, not only because of the welfare of uh, the lawyers, uh, and you know, I only last week, some, uh, a lawyer partner, successful, everything is going fantastically, but the firm does not respect my time. Is what um, you know what she said to me, and that's the experience of many lawyers. And it, it can't go on. Yeah. That you know, for, for <laughs> almost for, for moral reasons. So that's so so it will change because the culture will change, and with COVID, people have maybe been thinking about themselves. But I suspect the pressure will come from your side um, onto law firms, and I'm just wondering: are there is there a way when you're seeking um, your outsourcing projects from in-house that you can incorporate um, O-shaped value or demonstration yep. of O-shaped values in the, the tenders that come back, which might put the pressure on private practice to think about those things. Dan, da can I just interrupt as chair? Um, because we, I, I said at the outset we were going to finish at seven this part. I just want to free anyone who needs to catch a train or something. You will not be considered rude if you leave at this point because that was the scheduled time. But we're very, I, I'm very happy to, to to spend another five seven minutes in the room before we go to drinks. So sorry to interrupt the question to answer. No, I was just slightly distracted by the. I always wondered whether I'd eventually be able to write one of these things. Now I've realised just in there I've missed the chance. Uh, there you go. My dream is now going to have to wait for another day. Um, so, gosh, it's a big question, isn't it? So the answer, the short answer is yes, the client. So, so for those of you who are thinking, you know, the dynamics of this industry, our clients spend in this country about 50 billion pounds a year on legal services, right? It's a lot of money, 50 billion pounds. Of that money, uh, a third, give or take, 15, 16 million, goes to 10 law firms, right? It's incredible, right? 10 law firms making a, th a third of the 50 billion in the industry. Top 100 law firms making about two-thirds. So you're actually not talking about, so you're looking at mid-30s billion going to 100 organizations. Now, there's then 12,000 law firms in the country, and you can see they make up the rest of the however many billion I've got left over the third. So the opportunity is incredible to drive change through the buyers of legal services. So we're looking at cultural change. I think your question there is towards how do the clients use that leverage through the money they're spending to shift culture? And the answer is, I think it's a huge opportunity. And, and in fact, it's one of the areas O-Shaped has really started to drive with our general counsel community saying, you guys spend a lot of money. Imagine if collectively we came together and asked for the same thing, as opposed to asking for lots of different things that law firms will jump to to respond to client demands. They will absolutely jump. Now, what we've seen it particularly work with, well, I say we see it, to an extent it's worked with DEI for diversity, equity and inclusion, we have seen lots of clients include in their tenders to law firms to outsource their projects, requests and demands, in fact, for more data around diversity, equity, inclusion. Law firms will provide that. The problem is we're seeing lots of smoke and mirrors with it, and we're seeing lots of inconsistent questions asked, lots of data given back, and not a lot being done with the data. So you're almost now pushing law firms to provide loads of information, hang their dirty, dirty laundry out in public, and then doing nothing with it. So there's a massive onus on the clients who are spending that 35 billion pounds with 100 firms to use the data they're asking from the law firms for a good reason, not just simply show that there's a power trip going on here. Because this cannot be, the challenges we're talking about culturally, whether it's well-being, which is not great in our industry, whether it's diversity, which is also improving, but pretty poor across our industry. These aren't things that are going to be solved by one big corporate writing a letter to a law firm saying, solve this problem. This is an ecosystem issue, in my view. And what O-Shape is trying to do is to say, clients, use your influence, but let's do it collectively so that we can ask the right questions in the right way to, to work with the law firms rather than use it as a power trip to say, ha-ha, this is our moment when we can try and screw you over. Because all that happens then, if the system doesn't work together, we end up in this zero-sum game where, like if you've ever been at the casino, the house always wins. 
and the law firms of the house in this case. You try and screw them down on fees, you try and demand lots from them, well, they'll just ultimately add that back in. When you've got an hourly base model, they just need people to keep working and that money keeps going. So we need to be much more collaborative across industry. So not use the tender process as a tool to hurt and a stick to hit. Use it as an opportunity to create much more collaboration so that we all get information that's useful, so that the pressure is applied in a way that law firms can actually adapt and succeed with. And that will find its way back through to the law school system, which I think has an obligation to start leading in that sense right from the get-go. So the answer I should have just said is yes, and you could have had a drink a lot earlier. <laughs> thank, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, we had a question at the front there, and then we'll come to Ulysses afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't know whether I need the mic, but we'll go for it because it looks cool. Um, <laughs> I've been to a few legal innovation, legal tech events, and obviously there's an emphasis on AI, but more generally technology at the moment, and more specifically around that, automation is becoming a huge process. And you mentioned the paralegal, um, it will be able to replace paralegal. What I've actually seen is that a lot of the firms are focusing on uh, the, the automation of that client interaction that normally a paralegal actually might have, say, picking up the phone or actually doing those early stages of the um, client interactions, uh, learning how to ask open questions, discover more, um, and build those skills. Is there a huge danger moving forward that actually these skills are going to regress massively because they won't have those early interactions? And even if they have specific training around that, the only way they can really practice that training is with the interactions that they are going to have less and less and less of because it, the obvious thing to do is to actually build automation to actually save the firm money in these, uh, in these easy key areas. So, don't worry, no, no, as long as we know our way home, that's the main thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's all right, don't worry. Um, so, there is definitely a danger. This is where I think that there's a lot of people talking about the apprenticeship model, for example, is being lost now. Not the, not the real apprenticeships now here, more about the old school of, you know, apprenticeship model where you'd sit with the partner and listen to the partner on the phone calls. And from that, by osmosis, you would then learn how to deal with things. And now in the remote world, that's not happening as much. I think there needs to be potentially a shift in how we do things. So the idea of automating lots of the client interaction is probably, for me, a use case I would put to one side. And I would encourage the interaction, given what we've been saying, to be much more human to human. There are so many other systems and processes that would benefit from the automation that it depends where people want to focus their time. What we're hearing a lot of is that junior lawyers now don't even know how to have that phone call because through COVID, they've not had to do it. That, that they are having a very different type of interaction now and it's all much more socially mobile and it's all WhatsApp, and we can now interact that way. And I think the, this is what I was talking very early on, we were just having a very early chat with now, how am I gonna put myself in the shoes of someone coming through the system now and say, it needs to be done this way. I think it almost needs to be reversed. And we've got a future board within O-Shape that consists of students, that consists of junior lawyers, in-house private practice, apprenticeship, saying, what is it now that people coming through the system see as the future in how we interact, as opposed to it being imposed by the way everything's always been in our profession, the top-down imposition of how we work. This is how you work. This is what it means to be a lawyer at this firm. And I think automation has got... The big, bigger danger, I think, with automation, I think, is that all of the tasks that, that people have really cut their teeth on, rather than the client interaction, but they've cut their teeth on the more routine tasks will go. So how do you get people through the system? Because you're always going to need that expertise at the top level, but how do you build that up? I don't have an answer to that question, I'm afraid. How do we get people built up from ground up so that we do get people at the right level of expertise where you do need it and the AI won't be able to do it? But I'd hate to think we're automating the... Inter I mean, I'd love to hear who's doing that because I think they're going down the wrong path. Don't automate the human bit. That's the bit we need to keep, I think. Well, then. What you see a lot of in-house... And this is a real challenge that we talked about is anyone's heard of the legal front door, right? So the legal front door now sounds crazy for anyone that's looking at me going, I absolutely know what you're talking about, no idea. So this idea of an intake triage system, uh, so that if you are working in an in-house team and you get hundreds and hundreds of queries all the time coming into you, that you have a front door they come through to that triages it, that's able to ask some questions and say, almost like uh, if you're dialing, dialing and it's just direct, that you'll answer some questions and they'll put you through to the right place. But the real risk with it is, although it might then 
give you some management information about the type of queries coming in and what you can and can't do, you're removing that interaction, which is all the things I've been describing, which makes lawyers more credible. Are we now going to hide behind the tech and go, you can only speak to me if you've gone through these 14 layers first? That is going to increase the gap between client and colleague and lawyer, not reduce it. So I'm, I'm you know, the combination of human and computer together, this uh, and technology together is the key for me. How do you get advantage of both together? It's not going to be one or the other now. It's the two together. And um, Lucy, final final question of the of the session. Um, but do remember, um, questions can be asked when we have refreshments. So Lucy, over to you. Uh, my original question was actually going to be on um, what you said you really couldn't answer on how what trainees would be like given that AI will kind of take over the role of the trainee. Um, so my question now really shifts towards how can, can AI um, fundamentally take over and is it possible to actually go um, to have lawyers um, work hand in hand with AI and, um, and be able to generate those answers considering ethical implications of the law. So if, if the AI models understand all the kind of, um, all the cases surrounding one legal um, topic, they won't really be generating those ethical implications. Is there any way to um, kind of keep that understanding if AI kind of takes over um, these trainee roles, paralegal roles, and if it takes over standard legal learning? So I should, I should preface this answer by I'm not an expert in AI, right? And I'm not a future predictor of what's going to happen with AI. But if we go on the basis that lots of the more routine tasks that trainees have cut their teeth on are going to be done by artificial intelligence, then we do need to find other ways that people can come through the system. My feeling is that we're talking about lots of tasks will be taken away, but not the jobs themselves, or the jobs will be slightly different. So that now qualifying as a lawyer, or certainly in the future qualifying as a lawyer, will be less about learning the law and more about being able to translate that for the benefit of the client. And that's the bit at the moment that the AI will struggle with. Certainly what we've got is you could get a beautifully crafted summary of all of the cases and answer a question that may be posed to it. But without someone being able to go through that and give it the once over at least and assess whether or not that's meeting the needs of the client, then you're going to get the hallucinations that we're seeing and hearing so much of the case in the States where, I think it was the States where they produced a case that had never, ever even existed. That's going to keep happening. So in the short term, I think the concerns around it taking over the jobs are probably a bit premature. But what we don't want to see is more work generated by then reviewing what comes off our first cut of a question that's answered. And then passing that up the chain to the next senior person to review the review and then the partner reviews the review of the review. So you're actually adding on more time and work when surely this should be to take it away. So I think lawyers are going to still struggle with trust. Lawyers are not trusting people. Not only are we not trusted, but trust in others and what others and other things can do, we remain sceptical. So I think there's still a huge amount of opportunity to start exploring how do we train people to work with the technology and take advantage of it as opposed to simply saying either our job's gone or it will never happen. I think it's going to be that blend. There's going to be some brilliant opportunities. And as I say, the ones who look outside of the classic narrow swim lane we currently put people in and say, how can I use this to do my job more effectively and efficiently? They're the kind of people clients want. Smart people that can use smart technology and solve problems. And I don't see how the AI at the moment is going to do that. That help. Thank you very much. Um, so um, I have some thanks in between us and our refreshments uh, to make. Uh, firstly, thank you to Barbara and her events team for putting this on. Um, could definitely not have done, done it without that team, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you to um, Mike and the PLI colleagues that are here this evening and um, helped, uh, helped the arrangements. Um, thank you to you guys for being here. Um, on perhaps the only rain-free night of the last five weeks, uh, seemingly. So uh, uh, it's a great pleasure to, to, to see you here, and thanks for the questions. I didn't even ask mine, did I? No. So I didn't get to mine, so uh, that, that's good. I'll, um, I won't monopolize you in the, 
in, in, in the bar. Um, thanks to Dan again. Should we give him another big hand? Because that was great. <laughs>